So as some of you know, I've been going back and editing very early episodes of this podcast into videos. I originally never planned to release videos, and this is one of my earliest episodes. So I know the video quality, at least from my end, is not great. Lloyd and Darren look a lot better than the video I had at my end. I had never had any intention of ever turning these into videos, but with so much feedback and requests, I have decided to do so. So just want to give you a heads up. First of all, there are a few parts where I'm speaking and I edit myself out and you don't see me because I really had not done a good job with the video recording. I think those are only two or three moments in the episode. So not too many. Also, just a little note on vanity. If you think I look sick or really worn out, I was feeling sick. I woke up this morning feeling pretty sick. And then I found out the next day that I had COVID. So I had COVID during this episode. So excuse me if I look as if I'm tired or uninterested or anything, that is not the case. I just was not feeling that great. And this was recorded in 2021 when the Omicron variant was going around. So I just wanted to give those little disclaimers. It's still a really good talk. And I hope also you can appreciate the progress that I've made with this podcast when you compare the videos from my early days with some of the more recent ones as I've learned to have a proper setup. It's a process and it's fun and really challenging and I've been learning along the way and I really appreciate having all of you along that process with me. So now into the episode. Today's guest is Lloyd Arbach, and I am co-hosting the episode with Darren McEnany of Seeking Eye. Lloyd Arbach is a highly regarded parapsychologist, mentalist, and author. He has some absolutely fascinating stories, and he is one of the most knowledgeable people around today on psi and parapsychology. He's president of the board of the Rhine Institute, and teaches many classes there. He's also president of the Forever Family Foundation, which, as all of you know, I volunteer with and am very involved with. Darren McEnany describes himself as a lay researcher of parapsychology and afterlife evidence. Like me, he's skeptical, but has delved into the evidence and also was astounded by what he learned and and just had to go further. He also hosts a podcast similar to WTF Just Happened called Seeking Eye. So as I said, please have patience with my very early on podcast video recording quality and just enjoy a great conversation with a person we can all learn so much from. Hey everyone. I'm really excited to let you know about the science and spirituality salons I'm now hosting. During these intimate events, a scientifically verified psychic medium will give all of you readings, and I will give a talk on the science and evidence that changed my mind about an afterlife. This will also be an amazing opportunity to get to meet some of you in person or virtually, and to share more about all the science and data that transformed my worldview and got me through my worst days. These can be hosted in your home, in a nearby cafe with a private room, or they can even be virtual. I've hosted a few already, and they were really special. Fascinating, emotional, evidential. So if you're interested in getting a small group together over dinner, brunch, drinks, coffee, To learn more about the science and to get evidential medium readings, send me an email at hello at wtfjusthappened.net and put science and spirituality in the title. 
Welcome to What the F Just Happened. I'm your host, Liz Enton. If you've listened to the intro, you know my story. If not, here's a brief summary. I'm a science skeptic, and when my dad died, I took a shot in the dark and decided to investigate if there was any possible evidence of an afterlife. I assumed that was as realistic as Santa Claus, but I was desperate. However, I was so blown away by what I discovered that I wrote a book and launched this podcast. In this podcast, I'll be talking to some fairly normal people about some really weird stuff. I speak with everyone from psychic mediums and afterlife researchers to ordinary people who've had some inexplicable experiences. So come, listen, there's no need to draw any final conclusions. Keep an open mind and wonder, what the F just happened? Okay, well, I'm Lloyd Auerbach. I have uh, a master's in parapsychology. Uh, I am the president of the Forever Family Foundation. Um, I'm I'm a vice president of the board of directors of the Ryan Research Center and one of the principal instructors for the Ryan Education Center. Uh, I've been in the field for over 42 years now since the start of my uh, graduate education in parapsychology. I run a sort of a loose network called the Office of Paranormal Investigations have done that since 1989. That is an outgrowth of the old graduate parapsychology program at JFK University, which unfortunately um, ended in the mid eighties. And JFK itself now, which is where I got my degree from, has been subsumed by National University as of 2021. Um, I'm the author of nine, author or co-author of nine paranormal books and one book on self-publishing and also a novel called Near Death which is a paranormal mystery novel, co-author of that. We have our second novel coming out in a few months, in fact. And on on top of all that, I am a uh, professional mentalist, psychic entertainer, and former magician. Uh, Magic starting for me in graduate school, and then I ended up performing, starting perform. So I'm a performing mentalist and psychic entertainer these days, as well as an occasional chocolatier. So I think that's enough. (laughs) Yum. <laughs> the chocolates sound really good. Darren, do you want to do a quick intro? I know I've had you on another podcast, but yeah, you yeah, I mean, quick... um, uh, yeah you, you pretty much nailed my name. I'm Darren McKenney. Uh, I'm a researcher, lay researcher of consciousness and the possibilities of um, survival after physical death. I've been doing it pretty much since I was 12 years old, which came about as a result of um, an anxiety and depression uh, relating to the fear of death. Uh, Since 2018, I've had a small podcast, which I've used to share my research, which includes discussion. I've also had uh, discussions with researchers and and experts. I've also had Lloyd on quite recently, haven't we, Lloyd, really, Um, to discuss paranormal research and things like that. Um, So you can find all of that at um, seekingi, seeking-i.com. That's letter I. So that's pretty much what you really need to know about me, I suppose. Great. That's perfect. Thanks. So I guess Darren and I will take turns asking Lloyd questions and mm. wait, I guess I actually have never asked you this before. When you started researching all of this, mm-hmm. what was your thought? Did you always <clears throat> think there was a chance of something, psi abilities or an afterlife? Well, I mean, what got me interested in parapsychology goes back well before my graduate studies. And uh, it really as a little kid, I was influenced by certain TV shows uh, comic books, science fiction heavily in, uh, really influenced me. And I discovered the books, uh, the science books on parapsychology after going to the library when I was about 11 or 12 uh, because of the TV show Dark Shadows, the soap opera Dark Shadows, which is probably where I heard the word parapsychology first. I read it in a, in a super, I think a Superman comic before that. And because of coming at this from mainly science fiction, and also being a little science geek as a kid, I was heavily into astronomy and geology. Uh, discovering books by J.B. Ryan and J.G. Pratt and some of the other scientists in the field really put me on the path towards where I am today. Uh, but I, I never had any problem 
accepting that psychic abilities could be real. Uh, and maybe that's the science fiction fan in me, uh, comic book fan in me. Uh, so it was, it was never an issue of it being impossible for me. I actually had a parapsychology club in high school started with uh, a couple of the teachers were our, phys our physics and earth science teacher were both interested and they sponsored the club for us. <clears throat> and uh, we got to meet a lot of uh, New York parapsychologists because I look, grew up outside of New York city. If I'd ever been exposed to this as anything more than nonsense, if, you know, I mean, losing a parent is never easy or anybody, but I just wonder if I'd been able to have hope in some way before I started delving in, if just the earliest days before finding this it would have been easier. Well, yeah, I, I would say probably that is true. Um, I was also fortunate in college in my anthropology studies to have courses offered at, at Northwestern that were looking at supernatural beliefs around the world. So, and a professor who, who was assigned as my advisor who had the journal of parapsychology on his shelves. So the universe was kind to me. And yeah. was there one parapsychologist you met in New York? You said you met all these New York parapsychologists. Was there one that you were most excited to meet? At the time, I think I was probably more excited to meet Hans Holzer than anybody else because I'd read all his ghost hunting books growing up. Um, but I think I probably had better discussion with Montague Allman and Gertrude Schmeidler. Yeah. Did, did you, did you find much, um, much interest for your, your club in the kind of the academics of the school, the teachers and the professors or however, I don't know how the state school. Yeah, we, uh, well, first of all, my high, my, it was a junior senior high school in a little town called Elmsford, New York, which is in Westchester County. And my graduating class, to give you an idea of the size of the school, was 101 people. So we were one of the smallest public schools in, in the New York State system. So we had 20, 20, I think 22 or 23 members of the Parapsychology Society at one point. And uh, we didn't do any ghost hunting. We did have, uh, did meet with people. You know, Montague Almond was very kind to meet with us. Um, I, we did ESP experiments and a few PK experiments, including on a relatively primitive computer, which we were connecting to via modem to the county and teletype. But we had a couple of ESP games and, and things we did. And uh, it, it just was, it was a good group. Um, I, I can't say it was terribly academic. And since not everybody was interested in the real academic stuff, but uh, we did mainly focus on ESP and psychokinesis with a little bit on the ghostly thing. Mm. What sort of um, ESP games or experiments did you do? And what, what sort of results would you get? Two main ones that I programmed. This is back when I learned computer basic. This is going back uh, to ancient times. And one was a very simple, um, and we did them with cards also, was a simple uh, five symbol, you know, five card type of thing. Uh, generally basic statistics and so on. And the other was hiding that same idea in a kind of a, a basic sci-fi game where, which was somewhat based on an old t British TV show called UFO. It was a Jerry Anderson show. So I used uh, some of the storyline of that where the, um, the, the fighter pilots of Shadow, S-H-A-D-O, which was the organization, had to shoot down an alien and they had a find it in one of five places. So we, we kind of did the same kind of one in five statistical things. I did it both as uh, precognition and also as just kind of a sort of clairvoyance, it's kind of hard to do clairvoyance. You don't, because you don't, the computer doesn't actually have a symbol. So it was more precognition. Hmm. Did you ever get any interesting kind of results from it? A few people scored really well. I scored pretty well on, on actually did better on the UFO game than I did on the ESP test. Um, and people, some people did fairly well on, um, the card guessing. One of my teachers, a physics teacher who was from India and had had uh, a couple of experiences growing up, uh, he scored pretty well as well, you know, often when we did it with him. So what made you, cause a lot of people, especially teenagers, I think find this interesting and it's very rare as I know we've all discussed, that people actually pursue careers in all of this. What made you go so far with it? No idea. <laughs> okay. It's just something that it, it, it seemed to me that it was a mystery that, that we needed to study in science. 
Uh, and one of the things I got, I've gotten, always gotten out of comic books and science fiction is that the potential for human beings is untapped. We, we have potential in many different areas and we settle, unfortunately, uh, instead of actually ex exploring that potential. And this is one area that I felt um, since I couldn't get on the Enterprise and, and go out into the galaxy, this was the one area that I felt was the final frontier for me. Mm. And why do you think it is that humans settle in terms of our abilities? Well, you know, there's there's societal issues. Um, if you look at the beliefs around what we call psi around the world, which has different terminology and often either in religious context or in supernatural contexts, uh, there are cultural issues as to even what ability makes sense for that culture at that time and what does not make sense. Uh, there's justification within religions. I have a friend of mine who... Who, uh, who's a psychic medium, who was in a uh, very fundamentalist religious group for a long time. Uh, she was able to break away from that. But they used her abilities. This is all supposed mm -hmm. to be evil stuff, right? Mm -hmm. They used her abilities to their advantage. So as long as it was to their advantage, it wasn't satanic, wasn't evil. And we see this around the world uh, in general. If somebody is doing something that fits in the right context, then it's okay. But it's still, we raise these people up as special. Um, I, <clears throat> and I think because sometimes the special people insist on being special, that we don't know, we don't acknowledge that everybody has potential for these things. That's one of the things that J.B. Ryan did. He shifted from the special people to looking at, at the idea that everybody has some psychic ability. And whether or not everyone can do the same thing, which is pretty pretty clear it's not the case, or how good people get at certain abilities or certain activities psychically. Also, you know, it, it just depends on the individual's aptitude, it seems, kind of like with music and, and any art, arts that you've got as well. And I don't think that, you know, human beings tend to settle into a nice, even life. People, there's... There's people that are explorers, even within their own experience, whether it's physical exploration or mental exploration. And there are people who just like things in a definite way. They want to know that this is how things are. And so they don't question anything. And we're seeing that in the world today quite a bit, that people will accept an authority figure without questioning. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's just, an, it's just human nature. There's, it just seems that there are explorers and there are people who just live. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting as well, because in my um, university course on psychology, we've just um, covered the Milgram experiments, which was the um, Stanley Milgram who, who did various studies to see how, um, as you say, authority figures influence our behavior. Right. And it is very clear that a, a, an authoritative figure can really sway one's mind without really them having to question it. So it is a very strong, very strong factor. And you see it a lot online, especially with um, the very popular kind of debunkers or people that are anti this kind of thing, like um, the late James Randi and the Michael Shermers and, and various folk like that. Well, and, and really, um, I just got done teaching, which Liz took a uh, course on a skeptical approach to parapsychology with, with a skeptic, with Kenny Biddle, who's, who's truly a skeptic. Um, there are what Marcello Truzzi called pseudo-skeptics. And I think that a large majority of the outspoken so-called skeptics, they're not skeptics. They are disbelievers. Mm -hmm. uh, they are pseudo-skeptics. They use the word skepticism. They use the word skeptic in an incorrect fashion. Um, and they're not any different really than the true believers that accept everything. So at the one end, the disbelievers will accept any of their authority figures that make any statement whatsoever, no matter how absurd. At the other end, you have the true believers who believe anything a, a self-professed mm -hmm. psychic or guru or someone else says without any question. So we have to be more in the middle. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if you, sorry, Liz, uh, I wonder what, what, what your thoughts on um, the guy that I I had the chance to interview recently Dr. Chris French, who seems to be a very much more the skeptic, kind of the genuine skeptic on this this kind of thing. What, what are your thoughts on his views? 
Well, I, I know that Chris finally admitted that parapsychology is a science verbally mm. um, and in print, um, which is interesting considering he's been involved in parapsychology research for a really long time, even as a skeptic. Um, so uh, I've seen him, you know, he's, he's been, I think, very skeptical uh, in not necessarily a bad way, but often a um, persistent way. Let's put it that way. So, um, and, and I'm glad to see that he's at least looking with a slightly different eye at what the research actually is. Mm. You know, the reality here is, I just have to say that if Psy doesn't exist, there's something else going on. And if there's something else going on, <laughs> we need to know what that is. Unfortunately, the majority of people doing research on any of these experiences are parapsychologists, mm. not skeptics, not debunkers, not the disbelievers. So we're kind of in this little niche where, okay, maybe we're wrong, but we'll only, we'll discover that as we do the research. And it'd be great if we had more people looking at it. Do you find, yeah. and do you have any like fun examples of anyone who was really skeptical, who started investigating and changed their mind? And do you notice that most of the time it's kind of a two-part question do you notice most of the time when people have always been skeptical and they start examining the evidence, do most of them tend to change their mind that something's going on? Um, you know, I, I can't think the only, the only thing I, there's something on the edge of that to some extent uh, I've known people who, I don't know, Ed May brought a number of people kicking and screaming into his, um, into writing looking at the research and writing for his uh, extrasensory perception support skepticism in science two volume set, which is to me, one of the best um, pieces of literature that he and Sonali Marwaha put together. The fact that he got people in different fields to actually look at research in parapsychology and say that there was something here, again, not necessarily agreeing on our conclusions, but agreeing that there was something here to look at is amazing to me. Um, Chuck Onerton got, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no. When you say that Ed May, for example, and I'll link to who he is in the show notes, guys, he's fascinating. Um, wh what conclusion? You said that he had a different conclusion. No, 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 not, I'm not, not necessarily. I'll, although I'll, I'll get to him in a second. It's just that what he was able to do was convince people who were either skeptical or even on the edge of the other side of the disbelieving side to really look at the research, which they had never done. They had made the assumption, like most of these other skeptics and, and so-called pseudo-skeptics do, they, they make an assumption that there's nothing to the research, that it's bad research, that it's not well controlled, that the statistics are wrong. They make those assumptions because they're told that that's what's going on. They don't have enough interest to actually look at that. So Ed was able to convince them. Now, Ed in himself is a materialist. Um, he comes at this from materialism's perspective. He does certainly believe in... Um, a form of ESP, you know, anomalous cognition, as he calls it. He's starting to come around a little bit with psychokinesis um, because now he's understanding that there may be some other ways that PK could actually work. Uh, and as far as any evidence for life after death, he's fat. He's actually fascinated. He doesn't necessarily believe it, but he's fascinated by some of the evidence. Um, Specifically, he seems to be very fascinated by the cases of, of children who remember previous lives mm. because there ain't nothing that explains that. <laughs> so except maybe fraud, there really isn't anything that the best of the cases, let's put it that way. And then he he has expressed real interest in some of the when I've gone over some of my cases and some of the other cases of apparitions that are out there and even hauntings. He's expressed some real interest in that, uh, although he doesn't know how to how we'd even consider doing research on somebody who doesn't have a body at that point, unless we can get him into a lab. So he, I think he's, he, he's not swayed in his belief, but he certainly is swayed in looking at what things are and that there are other possibilities. Uh, Ray Hyman, who I think is probably back to his position where none of this is real. I'm not really sure about that, but Ray Hyman was convinced by Chuck Onerton years ago to spend some time. And he was in fact, the most familiar with research in parapsychology uh, again, I don't know how he's dealing with this today, but he was convinced by Chuck Onerton to look at the Gonsfeld research. And after reviewing that, they did a joint paper where he did admit 
that there was a communications anomaly. He didn't want to use the word psi, but he did say there was a communications anomaly, which is fine. I mean, again, we can look at things as there's something here. We need to figure out what it is. And if you're approaching it from that perspective, that's great. If you're approaching it from the side perspective, that's great. I mean, parapsychologists have often uncovered alternative explanations for, for all sorts of things that the skeptics then glommed onto and suddenly used as their catch-alls for everything uh, without, no, without realizing. I mean, I've talked to some skeptics who would throw something at me for an apparition case and said, yeah, you know who came up with that? A parapsychologist. <laughs> Right. Um, it's interesting because, you know, you mentioned the cases of kids with past life memories. I mean, even Carl Sagan was impressed by that research and said that it, you know, he didn't draw any conclusions, but he said it was worthy of further investigations. And he was right. not who was about it. Which, what made you mm. something? And I mean, he also said ESP certain... was worthy of investigation. Hmm. Right. I mean, there's certain cases in children with past lives that you can't deny, like or you can't really easily explain away other than, as you say, taking the leap and saying it's all fraud. For example, the Mart is it Marty Martin case and the James Leininger, of course, as well. Which is yeah. And the Leininger case right now is um, there is a, uh, a paper that's going to be published in the Journal of Scientific Exploration by a philosopher, uh, Michael Suddeth, which that's right. He's going to have some serious rebuttal. <laughs> so I know, but mm -hmm. he's, um, he's taking um, a very uh, skeptical look at the line of your case. Um, and I know Michael and he's, he's very honest, but um, he's coming at this from a philosophical perspective, not necessarily from the research perspective. Mm. Not necessarily what, from a data driven perspective. What would be the, other viewpoint of the Leininger case, because it seems just that was made up. The parts of it were made up. Mm. Parts were made up. Or that there was cryptomnesia, that the kid was exposed to things that, um, that, you know, were not acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And what do you think of that? Um, I'm going with, I have to go with Jim Tucker, who did a lot of work on this, who, uh, you know, says something different. So I'm waiting. I'm going to wait for, the rebuttal from Tucker and from a couple of other folks as well. I, I don't know. I know James Leininger, the father is going to have a rebuttal also. Um, I, the problem here is that we have to go with the outside researchers looking at that, not the principal who is involved in that because that raises the issue of, well, maybe he doesn't remember things. Maybe there was some you know, contamination. You need someone who can actually look and see what had happened from the outside as well. Yeah, which brings up, I suppose, the, the very important scientific principle of um, peer review and why it's so important. Yeah, you know, peer review has its limits as well, uh, unfortunately, because just like replication has its limits, you know, there's uh, the idea of replication. First of all, in psychology, in the social sciences, replication, it doesn't work the same way it does in physics and chemistry and the physical sciences, because the principles involve human beings and we make different mm -hmm. decisions. We're under different emotional st stresses at, the s at different times. You're not using the same subjects. It's not the same physical structure that you're in, which can affect your psychology and performance and things like that. But I, re I remember um, I, I worked for years, for several years in the library at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy sponsored laboratory here in Berkeley. Um, and one of the administrators had a PhD in, psych in chemistry and we got to know each other. He was actually interested in parapsychology. Uh, there were a few folks who were there who were interested in parapsychology. So we had lunch one day and we were talking about the issue of replication. And he told me that when he was a grad student, one of his professors was a Nobel Prize winning chemist. And one of their, ex their lab experiments that they were doing for their studies was to replicate his experiment. And they had all the details and they couldn't replicate it. It wasn't working. So when they told the guy, he had, he watched them do it. And he said, no, no, you had something on the order. I think it was either slower or faster. It's, you have to pour the chemicals this fast. Mm. So it had nothing to do with the contents, with the chemicals themselves, the components. It had to do with the speed at which one was pouring one chemical into another, which is not mm -hmm. something you can actually document very well in any paper whatsoever. 
you know, what do you say? Uh, we poured it really fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So yeah, even traditional difficult. science has problems. There, there are problems with replication. In traditional, there are problems with the decline effect in not only in psych, in social science and human performance, but there's a decline effect that's been reported even in some areas of physical science as well. That over time, the effect doesn't work anymore. So in terms of replication for the um, psi phenomena, one of the very common findings that we have is what could be attributable to the sheep-goat effect and one that um, Chris French mentioned that um, he's done or attempted to do several replications along with um, folks like Richard Wiseman and others who have never been able to su uh, successfully replicate the effects of psi um, phenomena. Why, why do you think that is most likely... Because. Well, if Psy is real, then their attitude, you know, even though it's not expressed, and Richard's a pretty friendly guy, um, may be perceived by the, the people that they're working with, or that they have used their own side to select people who are not going to do well. There's a potential for using Psy to actually select your subjects, too. Um, or picking them, you know, not starting it. It's kind of decision augmentation theory, as Ed May would put it. Um, that you're using Psy to predict that you're going to pick the subjects that people start this experiment at a time where people are not going to do well. It's going to fit. It's going to fit your model. We can't, not at this point. Uh, but one thing about the sheep goat effect I find really fascinating is that if we're just if we're not talking about the experimenters themselves, we're talking about the experiments and general subjects. The sheep goat effect is pretty consistent with participants. There's nothing that explains that. And forget about it being a psi effect. How in the world can that, how in the world can people do better at a task that doesn't involve psi, it involves chance? How do they do better at chance type things when uh, they're believers versus worse than chance when they're disbelievers? How does that happen? Mathematically, physically, psychologically, that effect itself, the effect itself should be studied by psychologists. Yeah. Do you have any theories on it? Without Psy? No. <laughs> With Psy, yes. It's just one of those things that if we remove Psy from the equation, we got to figure out what's causing that then, right? So if you're coming at this from a skeptical perspective and you see this effect that's, that seems to be consistent and Psy doesn't exist as far as you're concerned, what is it? And why are you not researching it? Why is it not of interest mm. to people? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Why haven't these the people who are more skeptical to this view, why haven't they picked up on that effect and kind of aimed to undergo studies to, to find out why? Well, I think personally, um, I think that first of all, people are skeptical. If they're truly skeptical, it's not their role to do that, you know, um, unless they have an interest in the subject. But the very fact that the pseudo skeptics consistently make noise about parapsychology and about the subjects in a negative way. Um, they clearly have an interest. They have a self-interest in saying, in believing this doesn't exist and mm. stating that mm. they clearly have an interest. So they ought to try to figure out how the sheep go to, I mean, I don't know why they don't do this. I've talked to some people about that and all they said to me is, well, I don't have the time for that. Mm. It's like, okay, fine. Then don't, then stop talking about it. You're spending a lot of time saying it doesn't exist. Tell us why it doesn't exist. Right. Right. That's, I guess, yeah, that's what I've noticed with a lot of the skeptics as I started researching more is a lot of them say it's not true because it's not true. And they can't go further than that. Even when you explain, you know, or they'll, one thing I noticed with a lot of skeptics is they will debunk, you know, or whatever it is, say, well, it's obviously this. And that was actually addressed in the study. And then they will say, well, yeah, I never read it, of course. But and that was I mean, what? I just find yeah. that so strange. Well, even, the, you know, the recent the relatively recent article in the Skeptical Inquirer by Reber and Alcock, where they state that Cy Vol what ESP violates the laws of physics um, but they start out by saying, well, you know, we, we didn't read any of the research. Why would we, you know, um, that, how do they know that it violates the laws of physics unless they read the research? And then there was another skeptic who, who knew something about physics, who then debunked their article saying they don't know anything about physics. 
So yeah, here's why it doesn't. And, and the guy who debunked it, who basically took pot shots at their article, um, said he doesn't necessarily believe in ESP himself, but he was very clear about their arguments being false arguments. Mm. And I guess one thing, because we're talking about the skeptics, but what about the most brilliant scientists? Because that's one thing I think that really bothered me, especially early on. It still confuses me because this research from everything I have read and seen is the most transformative thing I've ever seen. Like it's bigger than, you know, CERN and the, was it the large hydrogen? Well, it, it's, big, it, it's bigger than CERN for human beings. It's not bigger than CERN for science necessarily according to the way these the, the folks approach things. And again, you have to look at personal interests. You know, a particle physicist may have no interest whatsoever in string theory. Um, look, let's look at the Big Bang Theory, the TV show. You know, Sheldon does not think that practical physics is anything at all. It's only theoretical physics, right? So uh, when I was at the lab years ago, at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, um, I did talk to some some of the researchers as they came into the library. And um, when I said I was involved in parapsychology, they, they, they would say that's not a science. And I learned to ask the question, is psychology a science? And if they were physicists, they said no. Mm. So mm -hmm. at that point, it's like, OK, well, then I can't argue with you because parapsychology is effectively a social science, although we have implications for physical science as well. And then I could talk about, at that level with them. Yeah, I've never really understood the argument of something being science or not, because surely, you know, the definition of science is is the process of discovering the ways that nature works. So whether it be physical laws of nature, psychological, I mean, the only question is, is it, you know, if you're undergoing a process to find something, it's definitely a science, but is it a legitimate science or is it a flawed science? And that should be, I think, mainly the question at hand. Well, and I think that's really what they meant is that uh, because psychology is based on principles that are variable from culture to culture, from individual to individual, you know, you can't get the replication rate that no, the physical sciences are. I mean, that's what they were really talking about, not the process itself. Mm. I, oh, so I have another question, kind of switching the topic a little. What is, or is there just one or two standouts of the most mind-blowing things you have seen in your research? That's really tough for me because um, the things that I take in stride and I think are just simply cool or interesting are people, I tell them to people, they think, oh my God, that blows my mind. It's like, mm. okay. Um, I, I mean, I had a couple of personal experiences. I had a couple of um, out-of-body experiences, which were by location experiences as uh, when I was working at the American Society for Psychical Research, those were a little bit eye-opening for me. Um, I, I think that <clears throat> probably um, one of my f earlier cases, which is written up in Leslie Kane's book, Surviving Death, mm -hmm. where uh, the, the young boy was communicating extensively with this apparition, and we were able to track down the only living relative and confirm some of the family stories that were related to him. And yet the other family members had also seen the apparition. So it was not he was the only one. Uh, that was pretty mind blowing, especially when we asked, um, does Lois the ghost have any questions for us? And the questions directly related to a conversation we'd had in my car driving the 35, 40 minutes to Livermore which meant that either my car was bugged or um, the kid was incredibly psychic. Although why would you pick up on these uh, non-related uh, issues? I don't know. I didn't know. And the third possibility we found out is, well, how does Lois know this? And the kid looks over at this empty chair, which is where Lois is putting, supposedly sitting and says, oh, she didn't trust you guys because of Ghostbusters. So she found your car and rode in your car all the way down to Livermore and listened into your conversation. So mm. I didn't know what to do with that. I mean, that was more mind blowing than almost anything, honestly. Um, That's I, I, amazing. It, you know, the idea of her bugging the, the mother or somebody bugging my car, there was no motive for that. Literally no motive for that. Mm. Uh, the only, inf only way anybody knew about this case, because I talked about it, not because the family did ever. Right. Wow. So it wasn't even and that they were then... in, in to gain anything from it. No, they had no gain. They had literally no gain. Mm. 
Wow. In fact, um, in fact, I, I, I traded in kind. The uh, the mother in that case was an attorney, and she did some legal work for me as a as a thank you. <laughs> so in a, in many respects, she lost. <laughs> mm. Wow! And so this boy was just. Is, is there a thought that it was his abilities, or are there certain? Well, I, I mean, we, that ghosts, certain ghosts or certain discarnate consciousness are better able to communicate with people. It is. It seems to be the case that not everybody can perceive apparitions. And remember, some pe people don't always see. They sometimes hear or feel or even smell. Um, and that's probably the individual's own openness, uh, whether it's psychic ability or just being open to that kind of outside information. Is it, that's a big part of ESP, in, in fact. We're all probably a little bit psychic in terms of ESP. It's just that if you don't acknowledge it or kind of like block it consciously or unconsciously, it's not going to come through. Um, the other piece of that seems to be that it may just be that the apparition focuses more on one individual once there is communication. And that you know the intention from both sides, openness, total openness, because the kid was really open, the parents um, who saw the apparition about once a week didn't want to acknowledge it even to each other. And the kid's grandmother also had seen the apparition, didn't want to acknowledge it to anybody in the family. So there's not really an openness there. Whereas he, the first time he saw her, according to him, um, he acknowledged her, waved at her and started a, started a conversation. So there's probably a synergy happening at that point, at that level. Just like with mediums, the medium can be wide open, but, you know, of course, somebody has to come through and then there has to be this conversation. So um, I worked for my first job in parapsychology at the American Society for Psychical Research. Um, I was hired as part, a half time as the public information and media consultant. So I, I often did outreach to the public from the education department. But I also spent a lot of time um, it, just watching the research that Carlos Osis and Donna McCormick were doing with Alex Tanis on out-of-body experience. And I spent a lot of time talking to Alex Tanis, who was an amazing psychic. Um, he, you know, he had a huge impact on me in terms of my work with psychics over the years and mediums over the years. Uh, he was teaching parapsychology courses himself at the University of Southern Maine. Um, he came down to the ASPR once every couple of weeks uh, for a week at a time. And every time he came down, um, the FBI, somebody from the FBI, New York Police Department, Boston PD, or some other police department would show up to consult with him on some case. Um, and they were consistently there. I mean, it was not even, you know, we couldn't really talk about that. At the time, Alex never talked about his cases because that was his agreement with the law enforcement agencies. But he had the fact that they were coming back to him again and again clearly indicated that he was useful in some way. So um, Alex and I were sitting and talking about, you know, I had never really had a psychic experience other than occasionally knowing who was on the phone. Um, I'd had a couple of minor things happen to me in grad school, and I'd witnessed some PK as well. And he, he just basically kiddingly said something on the order of stick with me, kid, you'll have plenty of experiences. So not too long after that, I woke up one morning having had a, a very intense dream. Um, I was teaching adult ed courses in parapsychology at various schools, uh, adult ed schools in Westchester County. And uh, at one of them, which was about 50 miles away from where I lived uh, in Bedford, New York, I got to know a psychic who was attending my parapsychology class. In fact, a couple of psychics who were attending. And she did readings regularly. Um, I got to know her really well. I got to know her, her two daughters. And um, one was 18, one was 26. The one was 18 was living at home, visited her at her house a number of times. So I woke up from this, this, mor this one morning and I had this really intense dream that I had visited Danita and her daughter, Linnea, watching TV late at night um, in their house. And I knew, I mean, I knew that they, they were both late risers. In fact, Danita was usually up till three or four in the morning, Linnea too. She only did readings after I think two or 3 p.m. Uh, into the evening. 
Uh, so, you know, I thought, I didn't think much of this, this vivid dream, but a couple of days later, I get a call from Danita saying, so were you ever going to call me? And she said, um, you were, you had a dream about us. It's so like, I said, uh, okay, how do you know? You're okay. You're a psychic. She says, no, no, you showed up here and said that I, I popped in, <laughs> um, out of body and they had a conversation with me. So, all right. That then a couple of weeks later, I was at a um, a bachelor party at a friend's apartment. It was kind of after we had gone to a restaurant and it was pretty boring. Just there was some stuff going on. It just was boring the hell out of me. And so I went into the kitchen and made myself a drink. And all of a sudden, I literally felt um, like I was in two places at once. I had a really weird um, sensation. And I, I could see myself in Danita's living room at the same time I was in Mike's kitchen. And Danita in my visualization, Danita looked up and she, from reading a book and she said, okay, what's going on? And we have this conversation. And the last thing I said was, you got to take notes, write this down. So I felt going back. I, I took some notes. I found some paper, took some notes down. That's for our conversation. The next day I called Danita just to say hi. <laughs> and the first thing out of her mouth was, did you take notes? And we compared our notes and they were the same. That's the only, I mean, I've not had an out-of-body experience since then. I've not, not that I know of, um, not had that kind of experience. I had some PK experiences after that. I had a number of different psychic experiences. And every single time I told Alex about them, he said, you're going to have more. And I asked him, why, why, <laughs> why is all this happening to me right now? And he said, just to prove to you that it's real. You know, it was having a few personal experiences, which I very rarely have, but that really made me able to listen to mediums and believe them when they'd say, oh, it feels like this or it's like this before I was like, right, you know, and then it just, mm. yeah, it's, that's, seems to happen that sort to of, non- that, that sort of experience. That sort of experience also contains kind of the, the valuable information that I look for in out-of-body experiences, which is the veridical aspect to it. You had yeah. some kind of, you had the notes that you could compare. Whereas a lot of out-of-body experiences that are mainly subjective, you don't have that ability to, to prove that they actually happen the way that you experience them to be. But with yours, it seems that you have those, that collaboration that you could compare and, and find identical notes with. Yeah. And, you know, I've been fortunate to have, corroborative or, or vertical experiences of my own, but even the people that I work with, some of the cases I've got, <clears throat> having situations where you have multiple witnesses, uh, a consistent pattern to what's actually going on, consistent information. Uh, we had one um, one of the sessions we do with, with a, a psychic by the name of Annette Martin, who was my investigation partner for a long time until she passed away in 2011. We did a lot of work at a restaurant called the Moss Beach Distillery, which I'm still involved with. I've been working with in kind of a long-term investigation since 91. And in 1999, we had uh, 98, 99, we had a couple of press parties there and uh, we did a seance kind of thing. And at one of the sessions uh, where the reporters were asking the, the ghost questions through Annette uh, and on occasion, Annette, went into trance and the apparition would speak through her. But there was one thing that someone asked, uh, this is an old prohibition era building. So it was built in the 1920s. It was a speakeasy for quite some time, although not the kind where you needed a secret password. Um, it was here on the California coast. And from what we had heard from the local historian um, and from old time, I talked, when I first started doing this, I started talking to some old timers who have since passed away themselves who grew up in the area and knew the, they went to the place when they were kids or when they, even when they were adults back then. And, um, they, you know, I was, I was always in, interested to see if there was any like, you know, G men raids, any government raids on, on the place. Uh, it was thought that, and there was pretty good evidence that the beach below was one of the coves where smugglers brought up booze from, from Canada. And of course it was supplied to the restaurant then taken into San Francisco. We had no, no idea that there were ever any raids. And that made sense because the, uh, according to the stories from the old timers, people who, who went to the restaurant, to the speakeasy, included the mayors of San Francisco, Oakland, San Jose, and other towns, police chiefs from the Bay Area, 
the governor of California and people from Hollywood who were up in the Bay Area would, would go drink there because they didn't believe in prohibition. So nobody's going to raid that if the governor of California is there, right? Mm. Uh, that would not look good. It turns out, according to the apparition, to the blue lady, to Kate, that there were three raids on the, on the beach observed by people in the restaurant. And the description came through. All right. So several months later, um, I was interviewing a witness at the USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum, one of our other longer term cases, who's a former Navy SEAL and had had a number of experiences on the Hornet, although he refused to call them ghost experiences. He said, here's what happened. He said, I don't know if I believe in ghosts or not, but here's what I experienced. So then he tells us um, that he had had an experience at the distillery back in the 50s. He saw the blue lady, which from a guy who doesn't believe in ghosts is pretty interesting. And the reason he was even there in the 1950s is because his father was an attorney for the state of California. And he proceeds to tell us about stories about his father getting to know the owner of the restaurant, the original owner, Frank Torres, and then subsequent owners, because he met them when he was there on the three raids on the smuggler's beach below the restaurant that, were, that happened during Prohibition. And he starts describing what his father had told him, which very closely matched the description from the apparition through Annette. So that kind of experience, I, I don't even, you know, how, how do you, what do you make of that? It's not, Mm. It's not written down anywhere. There's no records of this. Maybe there is some, there probably are some in the FBI archives, um, but that's, that'd be on paper. There's no way to actually get that electronically. And the, the historian didn't know about that. Um, some of the locals didn't know about that. So what do you make of that? That's a, an odd verification that we have to kind of put in as part of the evidence. Yeah, they, 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 you know, people toss around, including the TV ghost hunters, toss around the term anecdotal evidence, their phrase, like it's worthless. But the fact is, we would not be investigating anything, even on any psychological experience at all, is all anecdotal, right? Any subjective experience that somebody tells you about is anecdotal. So there is no social science without anecdotal evidence. That's correct. Or gorillas. For that. Yeah. And rocks falling from the sky, gorillas in the jungle. Um, and it started out at anecdotal evidence until they, this is the problem is that, you know, you have these physical things happening that are witnessed by lots of people. Maybe not the gorillas witnessed by a lot of people, but certainly meteorites witnessed by lots of folks. And to not look into them, which is what happened, is ridiculous. Um when the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk in the early 1900s, there were reporters there. But scientists around the world were saying for weeks later that that's not possible. Powered flight was not possible. And did they say yeah. that they were making it up when the reporters? Pretty much, them? yeah. <laughs> I find that a lot of. Um... A lot of scoffers are very quick to derogatively compare. Um, anomalous experiences to the likes of um, Bigfoot encounters and UFO abductions and things like that. What do you think to that comparison? You know, there are so many varied types of human experiences. The only comparison is it's an experience. It's something that somebody did witness or had an experience, a subjective experience. But you can't compare these things at all. They're not the same at all. And even all reported psychic experiences are not necessarily the same because people do make mistakes. They're misperceptions. People do come to wrong conclusions, which is why we have to ask questions, why we look into these things. And the scoffers and the, the problem I've got really with the true disbelievers, with those pseudo skeptics, is not even that they don't believe it. I, I'm fine if they don't want to think that it's possible. It's how they behave around that. It's how they attack people. It's how they laugh at people. It's, it's how they are arrogant about their belief. They're so certain that this is not possible, that you must be crazy or stupid. And they do their best to make people feel stupid. And that is 
as far from skepticism as possible. And it's, it's far from being scientific as possible. I mean, it's just really, to me, it's idiotic. I mean, I had a friend of mine, uh, one of the first skeptics I got to know really well, besides my uncle, my uncle Herb, who was a radio newscaster in New York, was very skeptical about all this. So I kind of grew up with a skeptic. So it, it's, uh, it was not, but he was, he was not a scoffer per se. He just would say, eh, something like that. Um, Bob Steiner, Robert Steiner, who's no longer with us, was one of the founders of the Bay Area Skeptics. He was a magician. That's how I got to know him as a magician. Um, he was actually at one point a president of the Society of American Magicians. And Bob um, went through, told me he went through a process where he completely disbelieved in all this stuff and thought that everybody who claimed to be a psychic was a fraud and they were lying and all of that. And he got to, to learn from, he met people. He talked to people who had experiences. He spent time talking to some of the psychics. He was well-versed in cold reading and other techniques of fraudulent, of being a fraudulent psychic. And he came to the conclusion that there were an awful lot of people who were very sincere, but wrong. Even people who called themselves psychics. Um, he's the one who actually pointed me at people who may have been incredibly observant and intuitive and their family or friends told them they must be psychic. They should be a psychic. So sometimes the environment convinces you that you are psychic, even though you're not doesn't mean they're not useful or coming up with good information. It's just that it's not psychic. And, you know, I think Bob was close. He was still a little um, off to the disbeliever side, but he was always willing to look at evidence, always willing to talk about things. Um, I even got referred to him first by Bob's, by um, John Palmer, who was the parapsychologist, who was the chair of our parapsychology program. Uh, he had gotten to know Bob as well. So while Bob was not interested in really delving deeply into the research, he did not dismiss things right off the bat. Uh, certainly not as fraudulent or people as crazy at all. I mean, he didn't think that was the case. Although, as we know, there are people who have psychological issues that um, can present themselves as being psychic. Now, when you do an investigation, how do you tell the difference? What are we, between... Is a medium genuine? Are people reporting genuine PK, which is, you know, a mind's ability to move objects versus either making it up or hallucinating? How, how, how do you tell? Them? Well, you know, I've had over the years, especially when our graduate parapsychology program, we had a number of people who were psychics, even a couple of mediums who said that they wanted to work with us and we would check them out. You know, I'd have them do readings for us or take them on. A, sometimes I would take them on a case. First, I would have a long conversation with them, um, honestly, because there are personality issues um, that would make me not work with even the best actual psychic. Um, if you take if you're working with them on an investigation or if you want to work with them in person or if you want to recommend them as somebody for a reading, there is a level of um, humanness, humanity that has to be present in them um, for us to work with them. You know, for me personally, work with somebody in research or an investigation, they have to be willing to be questioned. They have to be secure enough in themselves that if I ask them, are you sure you got that? That they don't suddenly get defensive, mm. you know? So that process is part of my process of determining if somebody is psychic. Or, not, or, or I'm going to work with them um, or if I'm going to recommend them. And same thing goes you know, with medium, certainly. Um, then I you know, have to look and see the kind of information that they get and what they can actually do. Now, when somebody tells me that they had an experience, you, know, you really can't go back on one experience and delve into it too deeply because we were not at the location. So someone says, um, I can move objects. I have people who do contact me and say, I want you to research with me because I can, um, you know, bend things without actually touching them, bend spoons. I had a guy years ago, and I have a photograph somewhere of a guy who claimed he was able to not just do spoon bending, but he actually was able to take a wooden pencil and twist it into a knot. And I have a photo of what looks like a wooden pencil twisted into a knot from him. Uh, he's too far away for me to do actual research with. He had a great sense of humor about the whole thing. I would have loved to, the guys, I believe he's passed away now, but I would have loved to have, to actually have done research with this guy because he might've had something genuine, but he would have had to show it to me uh, in a living context. Um, we, we do try to 
look for alternative explanations when we're doing cases with with physical activity. We're always looking for alternatives. We're always looking. And I have had a couple of cases where one family member was faking out the others. So we have to look at those kinds of things uh, when it comes to PK stuff. Um, it's, it's not a simple, um, there's not a tell necessarily. Uh, although I will say that when I get calls from people who want an investigation and the case might sound really good. And then they, you know, I ask them, what do you want out of it? You know, do you want it to stop? Do you want understanding? What do you want? Um, when I hear, well, we think we can probably sell this as a TV movie. We can write a book about it. Um, we can put it on tell, you know, if, if it's that kind yeah. of thing and it's, you know, if it's a restaurant or bar, that's a business that has something to promote, I might consider it. But when it's a private, you know, residence or something like that, there's something wrong here. That's a, that's a, that's a red flag. So, and it's been a red flag for some of my, my colleagues, my um, buddy, Pete Haviland, who unfortunately passed away last month, uh, earlier this month, actually um, in Texas, Pete, for a while, he, he was not a parapsychologist per se, but he was an incredibly knowledgeable investigator. And we, we talked quite often. And he, for a while, when he was tr starting out, he, he joined the TAPS, the Atlantic Paranormal Society, the guys from Ghost Hunters. He joined their network to get case referrals. That's the only reason he did it. He ended up stopping after a few years because 50% of the cases that got referred to him in Texas he and his people would show up at this house. It sounded great on the phone. They'd show up there and the people would get angry sometimes, not always angry, but really annoyed that the TV crews weren't there with them. They thought if they were calling taps, they'd get the ghost hunter guys showing up with TV. So in all of those cases, Pete said that they turned around and left. And those might've been legitimate cases. He felt bad about the ones, but he's, but you can't really deal with people that way. And you can't, go past the idea that at least some of this is going to be exaggerated if they want to be on TV, if that's their reasoning. Um, I suppose, what what do you do when you're approached with questions regarding genuine mediums and, and genuine psi um, practitioners, I suppose, when, when you're approached with a question of, well, if they were genuine, they would have a, won the Randy Challenge, B, won all the lotteries, C, warned everybody about upcoming earthquakes or terrorist attacks, things like that. Well, first, let's go to the second two first. They're not all precognitive. I know that every, but people love to go to psychics to get their future. But the majority of psychics are not necessarily good about the future. And in fact, the really good psychics will tell you, and I'm going to paraphrase one of the psychics I worked with back uh, years ago, she would tell people right up front, you know, because they're coming about their future. She would say, effectively, the future can change. If I give you information about what's going to happen in two weeks or next week, the information I give you, you may make different decisions. You're going to possibly do act on this information, even unconsciously. So now if you come back to me next week and tell me it didn't happen, I'll tell you that it didn't happen because you did X, Y, and Z. So... Their psychics believe that the future is not predetermined. Not all of them are connected to the earth. Not all of them can predict weather. Not all of them. I mean, let's face it. There is a physical science, science that is designed or dedicated to predicting the weather. It is a, you can get a PhD in meteorology and you can't predict the damn weather more than a couple of hours out. Because there are so many things in play around the world. And the same thing happens when you predict something for a human being. There's so many things in play for a horse race. So many things in play, jockeys and horses, the racetrack lottery. You know, I, most psychics are not terribly good with numbers. That's what I've, they're more kind of right brain visual uh, in some ways. That's why associative remote viewing might work, but picking numbers don't, that doesn't necessarily work. Um, all right. So there's the future piece. And I usually tell people, if you are trying to find out about your future, find out what's going on with you now that'll help you make decisions for the future, which is what Kathy Reardon, the psychic, would tell them. What I tell you now is what I see is looking towards what's going on for you. Use this information in a positive way for yourself. All right, as far as the Randy challenge goes, there are a lot of layers to this and it's changed, it had changed over the years. Of course, now, you know, it's, it hasn't been in operation since 2015, so there is no Randy challenge anymore anyway. 
initially when I, when I and others first read the rules and the application process, they were enough to cause people not to do the challenge. Uh, first of all, unless Randy took a personal interest in it right up front, you had to first be tested by a local group. And that test was likely not to be fair. It was not being overseen by Randy or his people. Um, a lot of the local skeptic groups are not skeptics. They're pseudo skeptics. And you have to pass their test first to get on to the Randy challenge. That's number one. So there's a lot of effort involved. That, that's that one piece of it. The other end of things, no matter how fair the testing that Randy was going to do was going to be, if you read the rules, if you won the million dollars or lost, either way, Randy owns the results. Um, you everything has to be go. Th if you win the million dollars, everything had to pretty much go through the Randy found it through Randy himself or his people. Um, he could claim that you scammed them, that you you conned them, that you faked the whole thing, beat our controls. Somehow you did it. You're still a fraud. You have a million dollars, but you're still a fraud. So your reputation is, is useless at that point. Mm. Um, there are so many other levels that effectively Randy owned you. And if the million was enough for you, that's great. Uh, but there were a couple of my colleagues actually sat in. One, My colleague, uh, Julian Isaacs, years ago, sat in on one of the tests of a young girl who was doing PK. And granted... Um, you want to, as a researcher, you want to see what they can do, and then you want to start applying controls, depending on what they can do. I mean, that's that's very fair, and you and that may be a multi-hour process, by the way, to do that. So that's what Randy did, and they and then they came to an agreement. Everybody came to an agreement. This is a good test. This is well controlled, and Randy said, "Okay, now we're going to do the test." And this girl had been sitting there doing this for hours. She was really exhausted. Julian said, she needs to rest. No, no, we'll have to redo the whole control thing all over again. She has to do it now. So she failed. So there's a human performance issue here. And if you're made to do things over and over and over again till there's a point of exhaustion, you need to, if you don't have time to, to reset because they're afraid that suddenly you'll come up with another way to beat the controls in that couple of hours that you might have, there's a significant issue there. Clearly, that's a problem. Uh, the other thing, honestly, um, I, I talked to Annette Martin. I talked to other psychics about that. Annette was not a millionaire, but Annette was fair, was did well for herself, uh, herself as a psychic. And she and her husband actually had one of the first CD, if you remember CDs, CD uh, online shops out there before Amazon sold CDs. And they sold that to another company for a pretty penny. Uh, and she also, uh, there was a family um, hardware, a couple hardware stores that she, she was involved in. So when I asked her about that, she said, I don't need the million. I don't need that grief for a million dollars. It's too much grief. And so many others that I've talked to said the same thing. It's like, why would I ever want to subject myself to that man and to his people? Now, of course, there were people for a long time who thought that there wasn't even a million dollars. There really was. Um, some other people put that money up. And there were a lot of folks who didn't think that the test was going to be fair. So they didn't even try because of that. I remember hearing, I believe, on a podcast or reading one example of someone who went through the test. And it just seemed it was actually I wish I could remember the name of it, but it was Skeptics. A skeptical podcast because I always listen to both sides. And to me, I thought she'd passed and they were trying to say all the ways she hadn't. And essentially it was doing like, I believe like a medical prediction and she'd gotten it right significantly beyond the odds of chance, like new things she could not have known. I right. wish I remembered what about like three people and then she got one wrong and they were like, see, she doesn't have these abilities. And yeah. Was that was the thing is that it seemed like there was a moving target as to what the actual result, the agreement as to what, what a success was. Uh, and sometimes that moving target Russian happened deal. during the test or even after the test. Yeah. There were a few other people who also did really re what we would consider st strong significance. I think there was an mm -hmm. astrologer who did something that would have incredibly, you know, good significance. There, there are several other people. Um, Randy had a TV special years ago and they had a dowser, um, if I recall this, I have to look at that. I have it on tape somewhere. I'm trying to convert all my tapes right now to digital. But 
uh, this was, they had barrels full of dirt and water and one with water. And the, um, as I recall, the guy, the dowser found the water, but actually, but missed one, you know, actually said this one maybe is water too, but they didn't tell him how many water barrels there were. He did find water, but one of the other barrels he found was dirt. And so that in, it, it completely invalidated <laughs> the test as far as they were concerned. It was, that was not a million dollar challenge. It was just for a TV show. Not, that's not humanly possible for anything. You know, a baseball player can't hit, uh, you know, a home run every, you, you might do it one out of two times, but you can't do it two out of two times. And partly that's because every pitch is different. The conditions are different. Uh, you, you know, there, there's so many variables involved and with human beings, the performance, I mean, I don't know any psychologist who would expect in a psychology experiment, anyone to do this, the same thing every single time, the same way, unless maybe they had OCD. Mm. I mean, this is why, you know, statistical analysis is so important because you don't need a hundred percent success rate. You just need a certain level beyond reasonable assumption of chance. Yeah. If we apply that to physics, then the CERN super collider is a big, is a significant disappointment since, you know, even if they find the particle once and they declare it's real, how many billions of times did they look for it? Uh, in fact, in the, um, in discover magazine back in the eighties, when the article that came out short article about project alpha, where Randy had sent in a couple of magicians into a lab to try to fool the parapsychologists. And they really weren't fooled at the very end of things uh, when they, cause they hadn't, found under control conditions, these guys couldn't do anything, but it, that's not how it was presented to the public. But there was an article on the same page about having found a new, I think it was a new muon, um, you know, using a bubble cloud chamber in physics. And pr you predict the pathway um, of particle collisions in a bubble cloud chamber and try to match them to your mathematical prediction saying that here's the particle. So three, it was something like three bubble cloud chamber photos out of a couple of billion, and they declared that the particle is real. So if you, I mean, in physics, that makes sense, but you could, I mean, if that, if that was the, the, if that's what you applied to human beings, you know, all bets were off on everything. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. And I suppose to, you know, to, to give Randy his dues, he did certainly do a lot of good at, at showing many frauds. You know, to the I, I think that, yeah, I think Randy, you know, I am the first to admit that Randy did an amazing job on, on uncovering the faith, the phony faith healers. Um, he did a lot with um, that aspect of things. And yes, he did uncover phony. I mean, I've, I've uncovered covered phony psychics as well. Um, it's just that his attitude and the way he presented it often, you know, that's why his, I think that's that uh, documentary was called an honest liar. Um, I would say a, a lying liar, like Al Franken would say, uh, because there wasn't a whole lot um, what, to this subject that was honest about him. Uh, I, I had my own run-ins with him. Uh, he never corrected himself. So, for example, there was an article that the Daily Grail, Greg Taylor wrote, a lengthy article looking at the Million Dollar Challenge a number of years ago. And the first quote in the article is from me. But there are many quotes from other people throughout the article. And Randy, when he posted it on his forum, and it's still up there um, um, in, their, in the, uh, the blog that he had, he made it, it looked like, I mean, when he wrote it, I don't think Greg Taylor's name was even mentioned. Apparently, I wrote the article and all the quotes were from me. And he took pot shots at me. So Greg Taylor immediately let me know that. I looked at it. Uh, he, Greg actually sent a note to the ed to Randy and to the the moderator and editor of the forum and the guy apparently talked to Randy and Randy refused to change it. So the moderator or the editor had to put a little message at the top just say just a little thing that if you didn't notice the beginning uh, indicator that this is not about Lloyd Auerbach, <laughs> you would think that it was still me. Mm. So stuff like that, why, why not? Why not fix it? Why not change it? Um, a friend of mine who's got a really cool podcast called The Edge of Reality, uh, Lee Spiegel, 
Uh, Lee also work, has worked for the Huffington Post. He had a radio show on NBC Radio, NBC AM in New York back in the late 70s into the 80s. And I did a number of his shows, became good friends. And Lee did a review of um, Flim Flam, I believe it was, and mm -hmm. found a huge number of inaccuracies, incorrect statements that were easily, easily checked. Um, so it was not an accurate book. And when this was presented to Randy, and this has happened multiple times, magicians who found errors in his history of conjuring, he said the same kind of thing. His researchers made those mistakes. He didn't. And yet his name is on the book. Yeah. Yeah. As the author, when, when you put your name, when you put your name on that book, you take liability for the mistake. That total liability for it. So, mm -hmm. if you're not willing to take credit or blame for mistakes that are made by other people because they're working for you, that means you're not checking their work. And what does that say about you? Mm. And not retracting if you're wrong. I mean, that's really the thing. If you're wrong, you publicly Change retract it. if your goal really yeah. is to get to the truth. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, so it's pretty clear that, and this is the case with a lot, you know, James Alcock who wrote that article that where he said he didn't ever, never really look at the evidence. He wrote a book years ago on parapsychology. So at least he looked at something way back when, uh, but he certainly has may, may not have looked at any research in recent times at all. And of course the, the hue and cry against, um, the journal that was published that actually published Daryl Bem's Feeling the Future Precognition Study, when it was announced, the contents for the upcoming journal were announced, just the fact that all these mainstream scientists who were disbelieving, pseudo-skeptics, and skeptics were consistently trashing the journal, calling for the journal to, re to retract the article, to not publish it. There were just so many things wrong. And reporters would sometimes ask those mainstream scientists, those main, some of them were big names. Have you read the article, the paper? No. Why would I? ESP is impossible. I remember reading something. It was a skeptical article and it was actually knocking the Rhine. And I'd love you to mention the Rhine too. And they were mentioning going to an event and there was spoon bending there. And basically they said, obviously we all know spoon bending is impossible. We didn't try it. But, and I was mm. like, I, you don't get more skeptical, especially than I was in the beginning. And I tried it and I did it one time. I didn't do it the next time, but then I watched people bend the same spoons. I couldn't all women about the same size. And it's just like, I think that was such a revelation for me was how mm. all these people would say, this doesn't happen. This isn't possible. I never read it, but I never tried it, but, and I'm just like, that doesn't apply for anything like anything in life you really yeah. if you're going to take the time to have a strong opinion at least try it otherwise you could say oh, i don't really believe it i'm not that interested but if you are taking the time to make a point mm -hmm. and i don't know I mean, i've wondered this and i'm curious your thoughts about this is a lot as you define the pseudo skeptics a lot seem like they come from fundamentalist religious backgrounds where they've been fed Yes. And yeah. not to knock religion, you know, I mean, I know some can be really wonderful, but nevertheless, they've been fed a very kind of pseudoscientific life that, you know, with the worst of religion, the worst of fundamentalists and limitations. So they have a none of this could be true, like sort of maybe an anger to that, you know, and yeah, I, I, that's something interesting I've noticed is almost every single one seems to have come from a fundamentalist. Well, except that most of them are, are today, many of them are atheists. And some of them, they may have been related in the religion, yeah. You know, um, people react differently when they get out of those fundamental, um, those kind of rigid religious traditions. Sometimes they become agnostics for religion. Sometimes, you know, or they don't care. <laughs> Sometimes they change to a different religion that's a lot less rigid. And sometimes they go to um, some form of atheism, which can be incredibly rigid. Uh, and, in, you know, we see some people like Richard Dawkins, who calls himself a militant atheist to the point where, I mean, he is so dismissive of the people who have religious beliefs that the various, one of the major atheist organizations have kind of disowned him. So it's, 
there is a spectrum of belief uh, and disbelief in in the divine and God and a higher power or whatever else. And even sp- t- to me, if you spend time talking to people and meeting and discussing the lack of a God and, you know, if you're talking about God in a negative context, you're still doing religious discussion. So you're still behaving in a religious context in that way. Mm. If you simply don't talk about it or don't care, you know, that's, that's fine. Yeah. And it marks a difference between atheism in terms of the disbelief or the lack of belief in a God versus an atheist movement, which becomes political. Correct. As far as I can see. And when it becomes a p- political movement, it's indistinguishable apart from the existence of a deity. It's indistingu- indistinguishable from any other religious or any religious movement itself. Yeah. You know, the Skeptical Inquirer years ago started doing um, ads where, you know, asking people to to remember the remember Psychop and their uh, in their wills, in their bequests, which is something that churches have been doing for hundreds of years. Some of the some of the, the tactics, some of the uh, what they've done in the journal, in their magazine. It's not a journal; it's magazine and online and other things. You know, it's it's good fundraising, but it mimics what a lot of religious organizations do. You know, I guess they see, you see a good idea, so you take it on. So, but it's. Uh, the behavior is rigid. It is, again, the problem, I don't have a problem with rigid thinking or disbelief. I have a problem. I don't even have a problem if somebody says, why would I? Something like that. But to be arrogant, to react to somebody uh, who has an experience to say, oh, you're totally, you know, you're lying, you're, you're gullible, you're crazy. It's all woo woo or just woo as they're using it now. Um, if you have even have an interest in it, that's a real problem. Uh, years ago, uh, we heard about this at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, that Brian Josephson, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist for the this superconducting circuit, he's expressed interest in consciousness and even parapsychology over the years. And we heard at the lab, one of the physicists told us this, that he was uninvited to a physics conference in England. He was told not to come because of his interest in consciousness and, and psi. And the, the second part of that was a few days later, he was re-invited because many of the, the people who were registered who were planning on attending were then saying, we're not coming if he's not coming because of this. Mm. That's like saying, you know, if anybody's coming who happens to also be religious to a physical, you can't come. Yeah, it's, yeah. It just seems to be making. Of, um, oh, sorry, Darren. I was just going to say it, it's it's a form of prejudice. It's totally a form of prejudice. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. academic prejudice, and and frankly, the uh, in, in the UK, I think it's a little bit more open to consciousness inside than it is here in the states. States because psychop had such an, a direct influence on academics. We there are people who can't even t- express their interest in the subject um, within their department for fear of ridicule or even problems with the university. Um, I, I knew someone who was an adjunct professor at the University of Florida who was fired because of his outside interest in parapsychology and doing investigations. And he had a letter to prove it. And I tried very hard to convince him to sue the university because um, he actually could have, could have would had, I showed a couple of attorneys, he would have had no problem winning that case. Um, mm. the problem is that his wife had a really good job in administration and they didn't fire her and right. there would have been retaliation. And while they were doing the case, she would have been fired and then they would have had no income. So he decided not to do it. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What I just find so, first of all, that's so maddening because truly a scientist or, you know, skeptic is curious about all research and they seem to conflate data in parapsychological research with religion or spirituality. I mean, and not that there's anything wrong with religion or spirituality when, you know, as long as it's not passing laws or, you know, but they seem to conflate the two when one is very much data and science and they're, they're very mm. different to me because I actually. Well, well, the problem is, is the people on the other side also conflate it with religion and spirituality. Um, it, it's, you know, I um, I did an Oprah Winfrey show years ago 
uh, centered on a case that was uh, that was was in a book called The Black Hope Horror. Um, was a neighborhood in Texas where um, it was like the Poltergeist movie. This couple was having a swimming pool dug and bodies fell out. And um, that's because they turned out the developer put the development on top of a potter's field. It didn't move the bodies. So um, it, it, the, the, um, the couple actually ended up finding other neighbors and suing the developer. And it made the news as the Poltergeist case. Uh, not too long after that, apparently a writer started canvassing the neighborhood looking for anybody who might be willing to talk about their negative experiences of this because clearly this would generate something like in Poltergeist and we could probably do an Amityville horror type book. So he found a, found a couple who did that. Now, the first couple had a positive experience. They helped, they got a fund up and they paid for the reburial, the identification and reburial of, of the people in the potter's field. Um, they had a positive experience with an apparition. Another neighbor had a positive experience. So almost all the neighbors had positive experiences. And that couple was also on the panel along with the couple who wrote the book with the author. So Paul Kurtz, who was big at Psycop, Sci was with me. And he was shocked to find out that I was also incredibly skeptical of these people. Um, we agreed on pretty much everything. But at one point, the guy, when I was questioning, or we were questioning the legitimacy, especially of some of the things they reported as being responsible um, from the ghosts, the, the negative spirits. Um, they had four family members die uh, after they moved off, after all this happened, three of whom did not die at the location, one of whom who died um, at the house who ha had, a, had actually cancer and she died of a heart attack. So the heart attack obviously was caused by a ghost. Um, and we were questioning that. And the guy said, you know, if you don't believe in God, you don't believe in ghosts. It's like, what do the two things have to do? And I've heard that before. You know, people do conflate these two things and whether they're believers or frauds. And I do have to say, have to say also, Liz, that some, uh, you know, a religious reaction or an anti-religious reaction that some of the pseudo skeptics have sometimes. And I've met people who have been scammed by psychics, phony psychics. And they go the other direction or they knew someone who was scammed by a phony psychic. So that is enough to cause that kind of instant reaction and lump them all together as well. That, that makes sense too. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it's almost an hour and a half. I don't want to keep oh, you too I long, could, Lloyd. So yeah. maybe Darren and I can each yeah. finish up with. One I suppose a good question to ask would be, um, do, do you think that, the legitimate science of, of paranormal investigation has been, I suppose, tarnished by the, the more entertainment based ghost hunting shows and um, YouTube channels and things like that. And did, which would you consider to be the more legitimate than others? Well, I don't think any of the shows are legitimate at all. I mean, they're, they're run by producers and editors. They're not legit at all. And the methods that they're using, um, are based on the needs of television, not based on the needs of science. Uh, and unfortunately, too many of the ghost hunters out there and paranormal investigators are following these methods, which are flawed to begin with. So um, they may have a genuine interest in, unfortunately, not everyone who calls himself a ghost hunter actually is interested in doing anything more than getting that EVP that excites them or having an experience. They're not really interested in why or what's happening. They're really not. Uh, but there's a, a large percentage who are. It's just that they're starting from a perspective, um, a, a place that is flawed. Now, on the positive side, the shows have brought people out of the woodwork with their interest, which is good. Um, some of those people then learn that there's another way to do things, and they'll take courses or start reading books in parapsychology, also positive. Um, interestingly enough, I don't see too much from the skeptics, the pseudo-skeptics or skeptics in general, that that brings that compares parapsychology to what's on TV, to those ghost hunting shows. I don't see too much of that. I have been cast in that role by Randy, in fact, even though he knew damn well that, in fact, people knew he knew that wasn't true. And after he posted something about me, after I had done him a favor, it was the weirdest thing in the world. Um, I was told not to respond to him. And some of my skeptic buddies did <laughs> and basically dealt with it. Um, so, you know, you have a separation in that way. 
which is good. And I think it's because we're a lot more careful, although because of the way when I do a TV show, it can be edited in such a way that it makes me look like I'm doing something like the ghost hunters are doing, even though I'm not really doing that. Um, And I have to explain that, which is fine. Um, What's happened, however, is it's pushed all these people who have an interest in the subject away from parapsychology because the main show, Ghost Hunters, and the secondary main show, Ghost Adventures, have nothing to do with parapsychologists at all. I mean, Barry Taft's been on Ghost Adventures a couple of times. Um, I even did Ghost Adventures as a favor to a friend of mine on the sh- who worked on the show. Um, just a quick intro to the USS Hornet. That's as, as far as I've gotten for that. But unfortunately, there's a mobilization of all these people that could be very helpful to parapsychology if, in fact, they actually spent a little time learning about not only the real thing to do, but also how to communicate that within the field. Um, most of my colleagues do not watch those shows. Some of them don't even watch much TV. You know, they're in that academic world where they may not even have a TV, which I can't even imagine these days. But um, I've been told uh, when I've mentioned some of the shows or some of the stuff to some of my colleagues, they were totally unaware, which is oblivious to everything, which is also an indication that the skeptics are not connecting to parapsychology. What would you say would be the strongest evidence that should give someone hope this is really true? I, I don't think there's one piece of evidence. I think it's the preponderance of evidence from a variety of types of experiences. Um, you know, I, I really suggest people look at uh, Jeffrey, especially Jeffrey Mishlove's Bigelow Prize winning essay, which is fairly mm-hmm. lengthy only because he has embedded links and videos in it throughout, which has kind of made a, uh, a shorter document significantly longer. So it may look like it's a really long document. It's really not as long as it looks. Um, if you folks just simply go um, Bix, B-I-C-S, I think it's Bix.org. Um, it's the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies. If they go there and look at the winning essays, at least a few of them, Mishlove's and a couple of the others by folks in the field, you'll get a feel for the kinds of evidence there is. Um, the other side of that is personal. It's a personal thing. People who have an experience with an apparition at the time of that person's death or right after, that's very convincing. People who um, have longer term apparitional experiences, that's very convincing. You know, people who have a near death experience, that's convincing to them. So it just really, it can come at it from two different angles. But what it boils down to is we still don't know what the afterlife is like, but we do have enough evidence to indicate that consciousness can exist without the body, can survive on its own afterwards. Unless you're a materialist, in which case none of this counts. I'm going to add also take classes at the Rhine with Lloyd. Thank you. Um, That made a big difference for me. Yeah. And speak, speaking of which, coming up in uh, February, uh, next course I'll be teaching, we'll be looking at some key cases of apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists in the past. Uh, some of a uh, number of mine, but also some of my colleagues as well. Um, so kind of an in-depth look at some of these cases that uh, most of which suggests some idea of consciousness after death. And there will be a, our course on the evidence for survival will be ha- handled in the spring. And it's the Rhine Education Center. It's Rhine R-H-I-N-E-E-D-U.org. To get more information on what the fuck just happened, go to WTFJustHappened.net. There, you can order my book, WTF Just Happened, A Sciency Skeptic Explores Grief, Healing, and Evidence of an Afterlife. You can learn all about how I came to conclude that there most likely is an afterlife, But you can also learn about the early stages of my grief and the amazing, fascinating people I met along the way. You can read about how much I harassed the mediums and scientists trying to get evidence to see if the mediums were cheating and see if what everyone was saying actually was true. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to stay updated on any new developments and any interesting new what the fuck updates. So if you enjoyed this episode, 
please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if any of you have had a crazy what the fuck yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hey, reach out on either Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore or email me at hello at WTF just happened dot net. I love hearing from all of you. It makes my day hearing your stories and questions and feedback and all of it. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened. <laughs>